There wasn't an exorcism class in the seminary. I didn't have a class on exorcisms. And yet, I have people coming to me all the time. It's something that I deal with constantly. People wanting an exorcism. Father, I need you to exorcise me. I need an exorcism. I'm afflicted by an evil spirit. And many of the people who come to me have been already to other priests or even bishops, and they have been told that all they need is a psychiatrist or they need a psychologist or they need something. That they don't have an evil spirit. In other words, these many people who come to me are dismissed by others, even in the church. Priests and bishops who often do not believe in exorcisms or even the devil himself dismissing people who come for help because they feel afflicted by the devil or the many evil spirits who the Bible says prowl about the world asking and seeking for the ruin of souls. Every Tuesday night before I go to sleep in the liturgy of the hours that every priest is mandated to pray and that I promised to pray when I was ordained a deacon, I say from the letter of Peter, your opponent, the devil, is prowling about like a roaring lion seeking for souls to devour. Resist him solid in your faith. Every priest and bishop says this, and yet many have stopped believing in the power of exorcism. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus is going about commanding the evil spirits to come out. To come out. To depart. He confronts them and orders them out of people. And he gives his disciples the very same power and authority to drive out these evil, unclean spirits. There are 13 miracles in the Gospel of Mark. 13 miracles. Four out of the 13. And that should give you the importance of casting out demons and evil spirits. Four out of the 13 miracles are about Jesus driving evil spirits out of people. And I believe that I have that very same power to exercise, to cast out unclean spirits. Now, we all have these unclean spirits in us. We all need to be exercised, have them driven out. We who, like this guy in the gospel today, find ourselves in church. Notice where he's at. He is in a synagogue. He is in worship. It's not that we believe, as so many people say, oh, you know, if you need an exorcism, uh, that means you won't be in church or he's in a he's in a place of worship and it isn't until he sees Jesus that he begins to shout out what have you to do with us Jesus of Nazareth he's like a regular church going person in other words like us he doesn't act any different or look any different than any of the other people in there. 
because the unclean spirit is inside of him. Like many evil voices confronting us, telling us how unclean we are. Hence, this is why the Bible calls them the unclean spirits. Because their main aim is to have you feel unclean. To have you feel dirty. Like there is something wrong with you. Like the person who feels the shame of divorce. You see, when people come to me and they say, Father, I have an evil spirit. I sit down with them and I, I listen to their life. I want to find out what, what is it. I, come on, let's go. Tell me. Tell me about your life. What is it that you feel? And then we, we go to the problem and it's often the shame of divorce. Or the fact that you had an abortion. Or that you cheated on your spouse. Or that you slept around in your life. Or that you were married multiple times. That you believe these evil voices that have told you that because of your past, there's something unclean about you. And you keep being bombarded with these messages about how wrong you are. How dirty you are. It's the voice telling you that you're no good and you feel unclean because of the, of the uh, sexual abuse that you have suffered or because you were raped. Women or men who've experienced this, they say, you know, they, they, they keep taking a shower over and over again and scrubbing themselves because they feel so unclean. Somebody who, who's experienced that knows that you can't take a shower long enough. You feel so dirty. It's the voices that tell you that you are less than because you didn't go to college. How many people, you know, when you talk to them, they, they, their self-esteem is so low because of all these voices around them that have told them, you're no good, look, you're stupid, you're, you're, you're a donkey because you didn't go to college, you, you have a second grade education or the voices that tell you that you are less than because of your skin color or your status. Because you don't look the right way or because you don't live in the correct neighborhood or have the, the big house or, or the right type of car or, the, or wear the brand name clothes. Young people today, you know, they, 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 they want to wear expensive things because it, it, it somehow they, they feel like there's something wrong with them unless they have a Nike or a, or a Jordan or I, maybe that's during my time. That, that those were the, I don't know what, what it is today. But they, they feel like there is something they need. Yeah, unless you have the iPhone 12, there's something wrong with you. It's those voices that need to be exercised. Hence why Jesus says today, Be silenced! Quiet! Quiet! Come out of him. It's the voice of your ex telling you how horrible you are. Making you feel unlovable. And you believing that voice. The voice of your past, of your ex who said you're ugly or you're fat. That's why I don't want to be with you. The voice of the bullies that made fun of you that keeps playing out in your head, bringing you down all the time, or the voices around that says you need plastic surgery to lift up your, your chin. Somebody recently told me that I, uh, you know, I'm getting a double chin, apparently. You know? Oh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of voices around. You know, there's people getting all sorts of lifts. I mean, people are getting their noses lifted or whatever. You know, their chin lifted. 
Everybody's getting lifts. You know, they get their breasts lifted. I've even heard of people having their butt lifted. <laughs> I guess they inject something in there, you know, <laughs> to make it firm. <laughs> I mean, this is the world we live in, and it's so popular. People are firming up all sorts of parts of their body. I mean, I rejuvenations all around. <laughs> I saw a billboard once. I can't tell you what the billboard said, but it, it, it had to do with rejuvenations. <laughs> I mean... This is the world we live in, and we have believed these voices that there is stuff wrong with us, that you got to fix yourself somehow. And, and that's what needs to be exercised, because you're going to be, once you lift one thing, you're going to be lifting everything. I mean, you know, once you get your chin lifted pretty soon, <laughs> and then, you know, it doesn't end. Just uh, Google it, plastic surgery. I mean, it's a huge industry of billions and billions of dollars. People are getting them, and what, one, they get addicted to it. It's an addicted thing, you know. People get addicted to it because you can never be perfect enough unless you get it in your head that you are right now perfect because of the one who made you is perfect and you are made in God's image and likeness. Whenever a young person comes to me, and usually it's young women who, who have an eating disorder, who feel like uh, they're ugly, they're fat, they're no good, and I said, well, you're coming to me and I'm a priest, so let's talk for a little bit. Let's talk about God. What is your image of God? What do you think about God? And they say, well, you know, uh, as we probe there, God is good. God is beautiful. God is wonderful. God is love. Well, you are made in God's image and likeness. So the very same thing you can say about God, look in the mirror. Because if you want to see God, you look in the mirror and you see God. You are... God's reflection. So if you can say about God that God is love, then you are lovable. You are love. If you can say that God is beautiful, then you are beautiful. If you can say that God is wonderful, then you are wonderful. If you can say that God is all powerful, then the, the all power is in you. You have God in you. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, the Bible says. I reflect him. Whatever you can say about God, you have to say about yourself. So hush those voices. The voice of your parents who constantly is playing out in your head, calling you stupid or comparing you to your siblings or making you feel less than. Because I used to weigh 325 pounds and I was always told... When I was growing up in my adolescence and that there was something wrong with me that I would never be able to get married, nobody would want me. My mom would say to me all the time, she'd say, look at you. Nobody will ever want to be with you. And that's playing out all the time in my head. It's the damage of our past. Because I was bullied in school. It's something that I always have played out in my head. All the names that I used to be called. And then when I was in the seminary, being told by a group of priests who were formators that I wasn't good enough to be a priest... Because of this and that, they went through the list, and that list is playing out in my head. You know how that, 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 that accusing voice, that's the, the word Satan in, in Hebrew, Hasatan, the accuser, the one who accuses you. 
Whereas the Holy Spirit is your advocate, is your lawyer, the one who comes and says, no, hush that evil voice. Hush the voice of the accuser that brings you down. So what is that voice in your life today? I'm asking you right now. Is it the voice of fear and worry that is crippling you and having you feel anxious and depressed all the time? Is it the voice of sickness and disease that says you won't beat that cancer, you won't beat it? I thought we had the Holy Spirit in us that was given to us when we were baptized. The Holy Spirit, the one who makes us holy, whole. You are whole. You are not. As the devil wants to make you feel. Is it the bills that keep piling up or the unemployment that is staring you in the face in the midst of this pandemic? Or the uncertainty of your future? Have you lost a loved one? And the voice of grief is overwhelming you? Where you feel alone? Is it the voice of loneliness and despair that prevents you from venturing out and finding a partner? Whose voice are you listening to? I choose to listen to the voice of God in my life. The voice that tells me I am all that. I am wonderfully and beautifully made in God's image and likeness. And that God does not make mistakes. And I am not a mistake. I am all that because of who made me. And that fills me today with dignity. The one who accepts me as I am. Every other person in the world may not accept me. But God accepts me. Are you listening to the voices that have told you that you need to conform to be loved or wanted? The voices in the world that have told you that the feelings you feel are bad or wrong or dirty that have made you to feel wrong or dirty. Jesus today names the unclean spirit and says, get out, come out. That's what I want to do right now to each and every one of you as I exercise you. Depart town, Jesus says to the evil spirit. Come out of him. You see, the problem is that you have watched too many movies and, think that, and you think that exorcism has to be something spectacular. You know, whereas biblically speaking, it's all about what? What is, what is it that the Bible teaches us about exorcism? It ain't anything spectacular. Jesus just says one thing to the evil spirit. He says, be quiet. Shut up. Hush that voice, that destructive voice that is in you. That voice that accuses you. Hush it. Whatever it is that is bringing you down today that is making you depressed or anxious. Did you not hear what the second reading today from St. Paul to the Corinthians, the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians says, Brothers and sisters, I would like you to be free of anxieties. Because if God is for me, then who can be against me? That should free me today of all anxieties, of all things that bring me down in my life. If God is for me, and if that power is in me, then I am okay. It's a daily thing that I need to repeat to myself. You know, last year, 2020 was a very unusual year in the history of humankind in the sense that we experienced unbelievable fear and the, those words in the Bible that Jesus repeats all the time do not be afraid you know last year was a leap year and I used to think I was told 
when I was in the seminary that the phrase, do not be afraid, is present 365 times in the Bible, all over, that God is saying to each and every one of us, do not be afraid, 365 times. And then I did some research, and it's actually, and you can Google this if you don't believe me, it's actually 366 times in the Bible where God is saying to every single one of us, through the personalities in the Bible. As God said to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary. As God said to Joseph, do not be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary into your house to be your wife. Do not be afraid, Paul. Do not be afraid, Jeremiah. Do not be afraid, Moses. God is saying to you, hear your name as God is telling you, be free of any anxiety because I am with you. And if I am with you, my power is in you. You have the power. Do not be afraid. Live. Hush that voice that is telling you you can't. The voice that says you cannot have a different job if you are unhappy in the job you are in now. The voice that says you will not lose weight. No, you try. You keep going. The voice that is telling you, you cannot get over this depression. No, hush, I'm going to keep trying one medicine after another if I feel depressed. Or one medicine after another for my anxiety. The voice that is telling you, you cannot get over your addiction. No, I will keep trying. I'm going to fight my alcoholism. I'm going to fight my drug addiction. I'm going to fight my addiction to the casino. I'm going to fight all that is bringing me down in this life. I will not give up because I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me and I'm exercising now in the powerful name of Jesus that evil spirit that wants to bring me down and that wants to bring my family down with it. No. I will stop working 12 and 14 hours. I will stop being so worried about money and making money number one. I will stop it. Exorcism is something that we need to perform daily. I perform it daily in my own life. I quiet that evil voice that wants to bring me down. And I invite you to do the same as you get up each and every day. Tell the voices in you, shut up. You don't have any power over me. The voices I have to tell as I suffer from an eating disorder in my own life. I have to tell those voices that don't want me to eat. Shut up! The voice that tells me that I'm too fat and that I'm going to gain weight. No, I, I need the fat for my brain. A, gas, a car can't, can't run without gas, so my body can't run without food. I need to eat. The enemy, what, name your enemy and take power away from it. I had to name it, you know, Ed, E-D, eating disorder. What is it that you need to name that has to come out of you? The voice from your past? Shut up and come out? Name it. Take the power away from it. In the Bible, when you knew someone's name, you knew their identity. That's why Jesus asks the name to take the power from these evil vo forces. So that's why you have to name what is it that is bringing you down and confront it. Evil. That which is opposed to the dream that God has for you in your life. Confront it. 
Confront the organized opposition to God's way in your life. Confront the forces telling you there is something wrong with you. That you need to be this or that to be loved, to be wanted or to be cherished. You are wanted. You are loved. You are cherished. You are beautiful. If there's ever a time that you felt or you, you, you believe differently, allow me to look at you today and to tell you in the name of Jesus, you are loved and I know that because I love you. I wouldn't be taking my time right now in opening up my heart to you in the hope that you get it, that you are loved. And I know that because I love you. There's nothing wrong with you. God made you. You are not just something, you are all that. In order to live the life God wants you to live, you have to confront this evil, unclean spirit in you. It's the first step in any 12-step program. You have to name the problem. Accept that you have it. And know that alone you won't be able to make it out of that problem. That you need the help of a higher power. Jesus. To get out of that problem. See... Our issue is that we come to church and we want to be all perfect, acting all perfect, like we have it all put together. I mean, you know, you better not even let your cell phone ring or you'll get the evil eye. <laughs> Worship has to be tame, you know. Not some guy showing up like today in Capernaum with an evil spirit an unclean spirit. Oh no! We don't want that! Like the young men that I met when I was in Las Vegas who was part of, his, of the choir in his church. And one day, as happens to people, he was going through an identity thing in his life and he began to dress like a woman and he came dressed to the choir with makeup and women's uh, women's attire and the priest came up to him he says and told him leave now out we don't want you is what he heard and he was thrown out of church and he said when he left, he got into all sorts of things in his life. And I won't get into all the things that he got into. That's what we do in church, you know. We throw people out that are inconvenient. Like the people who come to me all the time. And they've been to one church after another seeking help. Go see a psychiatrist. Go see a psychologist. <laughs> Instead of helping people, listening to people, welcoming people as they are. We throw them out. The young men in one of the churches I was in who, who came into church dressed with a hat. And somebody approached him and said, you, you can't be here with your hat on. Take your hat off. All the holy people, you know, who, who want to tell everybody what they need to be like. Church is full of those type of people. That's why nobody wants to be part of, of what is the one thing that it is layered at us all the time is that we are so judgmental and we are because we think we have it all because we go to church. We feel like we're special. You're not special because you go to church. Gives you more responsibility to be different. Don't make you any special than anybody else. We're all Sinners. I, I like to say we're all caca-producing machines. Everybody goes to the bathroom the same way. 
I'll never forget when I was in the seminary, everybody was all scared, you know, because the cardinal, there was a cardinal from Rome coming to visit, and everybody was so scared. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And guess who they chose to sit next to the cardinal, this big shot cardinal from Rome? Guess who they chose? They chose me, and I got to sit next to him, and I was so scared, you know, because this was, I'm sitting next to the cardinal. And the, and the cardinal, after he eats his, his dinner, he eats the dinner, he takes out his teeth, and begins with a toothpick to clean the, the dentures. <laughs> he begins to clean the dentures. <laughs> that was all I needed to know. We're all the same. And they approach this young man wearing the hat in the church. And he gets out and he meets me as I'm coming out. And he says, I said, where are you going? Because I see him leaving. And he says, Father, they want me to take my hat off. And he takes his hat off in front of me. And he has a big hole over here on the side of his head. Because he had an operation. And he says, I can't take my hat off. I have to keep it on. That's what happens in church. I'll never forget in one of the churches I was at, a homeless man came into church and he was looking for a place to sit. And he, he's coming down the aisle and he sits in one pew and everybody switches sides, you know. And he, he keeps going and nobody wants him to sit next to him, so he comes down to the very front of the church, lays all his bags down and sits on the floor. And then I, I'm giving this sermon and I, I, I see an older gentleman with a cane get up and he's walking down the aisle. He puts his cane down and as best as he can, this, I mean, I couldn't believe it. He sits next to the man. I stopped the sermon right there. I know what you're all saying. You should stop talking right now. <laughs> that is what Christianity is all about. You see, because we prefer in, an enlightened church over an exorcism church. A church that knows theology and rules and regulations and commandments rather than a church that exercises people, that drives evil spirits out, that commands unclean spirits to be out of people, to shut up in people. We, we don't want that type of a church. We want illumination and information over transformation we don't like transformation we just like to be you know all all people need is more a formation and more rules and more catechism that's all nice but that's not what people are looking for people want jesus they want jesus they want faith they want grace they want their evil and unclean spirits to be out People are dying left and right in our society today from suicide and depression and anxiety and fear. And we want to give them formation, catechism, rules and regulations. Whereas what we need to give people is Jesus, for he is the cure for all that is wrong with us. To cast out and to cleanse us. I will take transformation over illumination any day. And I want all of you today, as I'm giving you this homily today, to be transformed, to be changed. Freedom. Because we are all possessed by evil, unclean demons, spirits, opposing forces, bringing us down. We're all confronted by these forces attacking us. Self-doubt, self-hatred, our past, our shame, 
People consumed by their anger, by their grudges, by their resentment, by hate, by memories, by selfishness. We are all eaten away by our wounds that never seem to heal, that keep us up at night. We are all weighed down by more than we can handle at times. And so no wonder why so many people choose to give up the fight. And to this, I want to tell all of you in the words of a poem to rage, rage against the dying of the night. What is it that holds you? What is it that holds you today? Rage against that as I end my sermon today with the poem, Rage, Rage Against the Dying of the Light. Listen as we end today's reflection. Do not go gentle into that night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day, but you rage, rage against the dying of the light. Fight on. Though wise men at their end no dark is right, because their world, words had forked no lighting, lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay, but you rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the light in flight and learned too late, they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Rage, rage. Fight on against the dying of the light.